This is the Ark of the Covenant. In this episode, the hiding of the Ark of the Covenant. From my second meeting with Ron Wyatt, I asked him the question, how did they get the Ark of the Covenant from the Temple Mount down to where Solomon had built a permanent place on a lower level to hide the Ark of the Covenant in the case of a siege against Jerusalem. This was something that never bothered Ron. I would ask a question, but but he, he just didn't go there. And this was a question that I had, how do you get it from this point to that point? Because I'm watching the movie play out in my mind, but the movie doesn't play. I know the Ark of the Covenant is in the temple. I know that during the siege of Nebuzaradan, that according to Maccabees, Jeremiah and several of the faithful priests, being warned of Yehovah in a vision, took the Ark of the Covenant and they hid it away in a mountain. And that one of the priests began making a marking in the cave to find the way back. Jeremiah heard about the, the priest doing this. He came back and rebuked him and said, stop doing this. The Ark of the Covenant must remain in this secret place until the last days when the cloud of glory will again be seen above the mercy seat as it was in the days of Moses and as it was in the days of Solomon. And so the hiding of the Ark of the Covenant, how it got there, this was the question. And with my meeting with Eduardo Reconati, in which I was sketching out everything that he and the Temple Treasures Institute were able to figure out about how this elevator system worked to get the Ark of the Covenant off the Temple Mount and get it into Mount Moriah. And he really uh, projected, and what they were thinking is that it was immediately under that stone and still right there. But the fact of the matter is, the Knights Templar excavated the Temple Mount. They went through this whole area. As a matter of fact, there are models in Jerusalem today uh, and these models over at Christ Church, um, in which the most extensive modeling that has ever been done through the case systems, what they found, and it was all done at a time that it was all accessible, where areas weren't closed off by the Arabs, by the Muslims, where these things were still accessible, and you can see that they've excavated in there. So the idea that the Ark of the Covenant is immediately under that stone as they were thinking perhaps it was, but knowing that Shlomo Gorn had been into the chamber and there's no obvious way into that chamber. However, there is a huge cave system in Mount Moriah, it's called Zedekiah's Cave. And in that cave system, there are areas that are collapsed, there are areas that are closed off. In fact, in our last tour of Jerusalem, with our tour group, we are not allowed to go into Zedekiah's cave because during a rainstorm, another part of the ceiling collapsed down and shut off another underground passage there that is no longer accessible. So these are the kind of movements and things that happen in this mountain, Mount Moriah, the mountain where Yah will be our Mori, our teacher. There are things in there that, you know, there are signs up that says, do not enter no trespassing. It's in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. Well, being unfamiliar with any of these languages, I've gone down through here and gone for another 45 minutes in areas that don't exist on the official map of this under terrain in Mount Moriah cave system down there. It is bothering me, and has bothered me for two years. How did the Ark of the Covenant get from where it was to there? And so now, with the writer laying this out, I know the mechanics do not work, but one thing I know, I need to go to the Red Sea Crossing site. And so, with me is Bo Coffey, former Special Forces after the Vietnam War, he was sent in to rescue people in POW camps in, in Vietnam. We see Rambo and Chuck Norris do the same thing later, but uh, uh, according to Bo, you actually do have to reload during some of these things. <laughs> so the smallest guy with us is like 6'3". Also, Terry, too tall to ligman, and you get the idea. He goes down there with me. Uh, Jamie Louie, former football player, college football player, all these guys, big husky guys, and 
You know, as the saying goes, if a Marine is too old to fight, he'll just kill you. And so we take a person who is known to be probably one of the greatest kung fu artists of our day and time, my 18-year-old daughter, Lee, and we all head down to Nueva, Egypt. And while we are down in Nueva, Egypt, we're down there at the crossing site, and that's where a Bedouin fires up her saj and makes this unleavened bread on the grill, and that's why I'm able to make these sajas, and everyone makes unleavened bread at our Passover today because of what happened right there. But that's not the significant, or most significant thing is. Right there at Nueva, Egypt, where there is a pillar that is standing, this is the pillar that Ron Wyatt found on the beach while Israel controlled the Sinai Peninsula. It was a Phoenician-style pillar that was awash on the beach, all eroded, but when the Israeli officers came down there and looked at it, well, they had been to geography and archeology span school in Israel. They know this is Phoenician-style. This is from the time of Solomon. And so the engineers brought in a crane, picked it up, set it in concrete at the end of the Wadi Watir. This is the very Wadi that Israel came down and found themselves on the shore of what is now Nueva, Egypt. They picked it up, they put it in concrete. It was a couple years later that Ron Wyatt then trespassed across the eight mile stretch of the Yam Suf, as it is in Hebrew, also translated Red Sea, it's really the Sea of Reeds or Sea Weeds, and it is there across that eight miles, he found another pillar still standing. This one was not so eroded in an ancient Paleo-Hebrew could be made out Solomon. Egypt, Mitzrayim, Pharaoh, death, Moses, and from that knew that Solomon had erected these pillars on each side of the crossing site for the crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground. Solomon knew where it was. Solomon built his seaport at Etzion Gever next to a lot, just another 70 kilometers to the north. Etzion Gever is right next to a lot, a lot is still there. The King Solomon Hotel is there, still to this day. A very nice five-star hotel. That's the Yom Zuf. that's the crossing site down there. And so now we find out that there is a bus that goes up the Wadi Watir right by Etham, where Israel turned to the south, entered the Wadi Watir, and then on over to Cairo. So we all jump in this Egyptian bus and we all go to Cairo. When we get there, of course, we go out to the Great Pyramid of Giza, visit the Sphinx, other things that are there, and but it was at the Great Pyramid of Giza, this is really what I wanted to see. See, the Great Pyramid of Giza at one time had polished limestone facing on it. What you see are like steps today. But in its day, it was built with polished limestone that you could not fit a credit, a, a business card, which is 1 50th of an inch in the perfect aligned cracks. When they attempted to get into the Great Pyramid of Giza in later years, they had to chisel away and the, the cement that was used to fasten the sandstone to the actual rocks, that was so strong that the rock would break rather than the cement. And that cement was poured vertically and absolutely perfect. We still today cannot build the Great Pyramid of Giza. They said, Josephus said that the sun shining on the side of the Pyramid of Giza could be seen like a beacon in the land of Israel. A brilliant, brilliant mirror, highly polished in the sun. When they went into it, they, they bored through the side, they found an interior passage, and then they came to this huge granite plug. They bored, they couldn't go through it, they bored down to the left and found another passage. They went to the end of the passage and pushed on the wall and it opened up into the clear blue space. There was a door the whole time, but you could never see it. And then they couldn't go through the granite plug, so they burrowed the way around and then found the ascending chamber and then the king's chamber, what's called the king's and queen's chamber up there. But there, 
I had my daughter stand and put her hand on that red granite plug. Because what they did in chiseling this whole timepiece out, and this is very obviously comes from a time the Egyptians tried to copy it, but the Egyptians could not build what they find in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Pyramids that were built at a later date, lopsided, some of them fell over. This is something that is very significant, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have time to get into now, but I had my daughter put her hand on that stone plug and I took the picture because what happened when they finished the excavation of this, excuse me, the building of this, and all of the interior passages, what they did is they knock out the keystones, this red granite plug then slides down, slams into place, and, they're, and it seals it up tight, and nobody gets past that red granite plug. I go from there, now we're going down into the smaller pyramids. We're going down into the tombs of pharaohs. And then I see how they do, not only the red granite plug, but why it is that the grave robbers didn't find the entrance. They burrowed in another way, and then the entrance was found. Because once the tomb was dug, what they did is that they had a stone that was all ready to go, they knocked out the keystones, it slammed in place, and you could never see how to get into this thing. Absolutely perfect. Now, I get back to Jerusalem and I start drawing this out because the scriptures say that Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He married his daughter and he brought her into Jerusalem and didn't leave until he had finished building his house and the Beit HaMikdash, the house of Yehovah. Affinity with the king of Egypt, he now marries into the building secrets of Egypt. And the stone and sand hydraulic technology that was evident in the land of Egypt before this period of time. Solomon doesn't need to recreate the wheel. He simply has to marry the Pharaoh's daughter. And he gets in on all of the goodies. And then he builds the house of Yehovah. He builds a sand hydraulic elevator system in order to hide the Ark of the Covenant in the case of siege in Jerusalem. He builds him not only a glorious house on a higher level, as Eduardo Reconati pointed out, from that singular usage of a Hebrew word that's never used anywhere else in the Bible, but only in secret Jewish literature. And then he built himself, a, built a place on a lower level for the ark to reside for an extremely long period of time. Now I come back and I begin assembling this thing. I assembled this whole, whole thing in a PowerPoint. I come back to America and I go to a university in Ohio, excuse me, in Oklahoma, uh, where we just rent the facility, the uh, theater there, and I'm doing a presentation, it's a Christian college. And when they find out that I'm teaching on the Feast of the Lord and their prophetic fulfillment, then they decide to cancel me the second night until we go to the dean of the college and uh, remind him that the best lawyers in the world are Jewish and we expect that he may want to consider throwing me out of here. And so we were on the next night. I knew I wasn't welcome, so I'm not gonna hang around long. I get a call from Bo Coffee. He said, oh, wait, just, just a minute, just a minute. That next morning I wake up, okay, what do I do? Bo Coffee calls, I haven't heard from him for months. He says, you have got to come down to, to uh, Dallas, Texas. You have gotta come down here and teach. I will make a phone call and I'll have a crowd together just like this. The problem is I have got to leave in just a couple of days. Can you come down? Okay, here's the answer, I go down there. Turns out that the Prophecy Club is meeting in this hotel. Bo Coffey, who used to take Ron Wyatt around for the Prophecy Club along with Dimitri Dudeman and Henry Groover, Bo knows the hotel and so he books me in the hotel and we arrive that night and right at the top of the stairs, I have a room, here it is, this is my room, but next door, it's the Prophecy Club meeting. Who would have guessed that? Well, as people come to the top of the stairs, they start to get their $7 out and pay, and, they, and we have to say, no, this isn't the Prophecy Club, this is free, but you came here for the Prophecy Club. 
If you wanna come here, we suggest you go next door, give your $7 to them, and then you can come over here free if you like to. Which we thought that would be the only honest way of handling that, you know, because they think we are the Prowse Club because we're right at the head of the stairs, right there at the hotel. Well, 27 people show up that night. Bo, I thought you said you'd have this place filled. And then, the next morning, he gets on a plane and gets out of there. The next morning, I say, well, this is ridiculous. And I know I've gotta teach that night, but that morning, I pray. I call up uh, one radio personality, call up uh, and try to get back a hold of David Walkerson. He'd called earlier and wanted me to come to New York, and so, oh, I thought, okay, you know, this is, these are the doors that's opening, I'm shut down right here, I'll make the phone call. I can't get a hold of anyone, I am so frustrated, I finally say, okay, I'm not moving from here until you tell me when to go and where to go, that's it. I walked away from Oklahoma, I could have kept on pressing that because we had over 200 people a night. I come down here for 27 people? Oh, this is gonna go a long way. So then next night, kept that little room, 157 people show up, standing room only. We go down to the desk, do you have a room available for tomorrow night? We need a little larger room. Yeah, we're empty all week. They open up the curtain, next night 300 people show up. Then the next night it's over 500. The next night it's over 900 people that show up. And then, three days later I get a call from Stan Johnson of the Prophecy Club. I figure he's not real happy. (laughs) Because now, all the people at the Prophecy Club, you know, the 200 people, whatever, are now coming to my thing, now it's 900 people, and I mikvah baptized over 200 people in the hotel pool that Sunday. The door's just, just wide open, incredible stuff happening there. And I'll keep that story short, because that one could go on for another couple of hours of what took place, but, Bo Coffey told me, he said, if you ever get a chance to go on the Prophecy Club, do it. But I'll warn you, you won't make any money. Stan Johnson is gonna make all the money on this and you're gonna make very little. You're gonna get $200 a night for speaking and he is going to rake in the dough. But if you can do it, but if you can do it and not hold a grudge, do it. And he also told me, I understood, because I've been to some Prophecy Club meetings before, and I understood how they do it. You know, taking the offering, you think, not that it's said this way, but you think that if you really like that speaker, you're gonna give, and that speaker's gonna get the money. It's not spoken that, it's not said that way, but everyone has that firm impression. And I didn't like that. I, I felt that it was deceitful. Personally, I did. And so I get a call from Stan, and he had uh, been to one of my meetings, I didn't even know it, he was in the back, up in Wichita. And then he called me up and said, I'd like you to be on the Prophecy Club tour. Now, uh, two years before, there were people that were trying to get me on there, and the Prophecy Club was all pre-tribulation rapture. And so they didn't want to touch me with the 10-foot pole because I was definitely on the other side of the fence on this. Two years later, Everything had changed, Stan asked me to come on, and so now I'm in the hotel room and I am pacing. Pacing in the hotel room, I'm praying. I said, Lord, if you want me to go on the Prophecy Club tour, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from you. And he's waiting for a phone call back and bam, the phone rings. And it is a brother I hadn't seen in a long time, he's got a biker ministry up in Kansas, and he said, you know, I was just praying and I got this picture of you speaking on the Prophecy Club tour. And he said, if you get the chance to be on the Prophecy Club, do it, because your message will go to the whole world. I said, thanks, Dan. I hung up the phone. I said, thank you, Father. I called up Stan and I said, I'll do it. First place is Kansas City. And that is where Stan opens the meeting. Before the meeting starts, I said, Stan, please, let me take the offering for you tonight. He said, I always take the offering. I said, I know, let me take the offering. I assure you that you're gonna be happy. So, I spoke on the great secret of Solomon's temple and the hiding of the Ark of the Covenant that night. At the time when the offering came, 
I said, the Prophecy Club pays for my airline tickets. They pay for my meals. They take care of me completely. They put me on radio, they put me on television. They make sure all of my needs are met. If you appreciate the message you're getting, I want you to give to the Prophecy Club because they're the ones that are hanging it all out on the line. They take care of me so that I can minister to you. They had, Stan said at the end of that night, it was the biggest offering they ever had. And he said, from now on, you take the offerings at all the Prophecy Club meetings. <laughs> and see, I was set free because I was telling the truth, and I mean I was telling the truth. For them to take care of all these things, and later, Stan Johnson shows me the books. He shows me every month the nut for all the radio and TV is a quarter million dollars a month. And people would criticize Stan, oh, it's all about the money. Well, you better believe if you gotta pay a quarter million dollars a month, you better have things in order and you've gotta have the backbone to stand there and shell out a quarter million dollars a month for what you don't know if anyone's gonna support that ministry. And seven dollars a head doesn't do it, ladies and gentlemen. I respect Stan Johnson. I respect what he did. And when Henry Gruber was on tour and he found out that there was a false prophet that was out there and they'd reproduce some of his materials, he called up Stan Johnson and said, Stan, you either get this man's materials out of here or I will never speak for the Prophecy Club again. And he said, what is going on? He told him, Stan called up every Prophecy Club with all the thousands of dollars of materials and said, get this man's stuff off, he's a false prophet. And he flushed the toilet just like that. See, Stan couldn't watch over and make sure that everyone who spoke was a true prophet. But the people out there, their responsibility was say, Stan, we found one, he's a false prophet, and he'd flush the toilet on him. I respect Stan Johnson. It's not all about money, but it takes money to do the work of the ministry. And I said, support him, and he supported him. Well, the tour continued on. I'm the first one in the Prophecy Club to ever have a video projector and to do PowerPoint. Before that was all glass scenes, you know, on a, you know, a, what, do you, what do you call that? An overhead projector. That's what I was using. That's what I was using when I had 900 people in the room. Now, now I'm able to get a video projector and I put it on there. And now I've got the animation for the Ark of the Covenant, all this stuff. I'm showing this night after night. And then I fly down to Houston. I arrive, I unpack the video projector and the video projector I see shavings of glass. Continental Airlines. I arrive, I pull it out, and I shake it, and I hear things. And so I lay hands on my video projector, <laughs> and I pray, and I pray because I have seen mechanical miracles happen, and I know the message that I'm speaking is true and that the Almighty has led me on this path and I must deliver this message. And so I know it's gonna be a miracle, something's gonna happen. Plugged it in, nothing happened. As I find out later that video projectors run on smoke and if you plug it in and the smoke comes out, then you can never get it to work again. Well, that night, Instead of my usual, you know, the Prophecy Club meeting is like two, two and a half hours long, the speakers would speak. I would go for four, four and a half hours. That night, it took me five hours to tell the story. And a person came up to me and said, if you can spend the night, if you can stay here, we'll take your video projector over to a friend of mine and he can repair it. And I said, why, does he have a shop? You know, I'm asking questions, I, you know, a friend of his, okay? You know, this guy had long hair and a beard, you know, the kind of person you can't trust. <laughs> he could be crazy, I know. And he said, uh, no, but he's a genius, he can fix anything. Oh, great, now he has a friend who's a genius. But then I realized, I'm flying to Corpus Christi, first thing in the morning, I get to Corpus Christi for a day off and a night off, then the next night I speak. What are the chances of me getting this repaired in Corpus Christi, the body of Christ, 
rather than in Houston, Texas, a big metropolitan area. And so I call up that night, I get a hold of Continental Airlines, and they say to change your ticket will be $900. I said, look, sweetheart, Continental Airlines broke my video projector. You either change my ticket and I can probably get it fixed, or you come up with $4,000 and Continental Airlines pays for it. I'll hold on just a minute, sir. Um, we've got your ticket, ticket changed. The next morning he picks me up and he takes me over to this genius friend of his. We arrive at this little airport, we come up to this airport hangar, which could fit a Convair 880 in with 150 passengers. He lives in this thing. We go inside and I am looking at a high tech place with a guy who was a former avionics engineer for Continental Airlines, but he retired in his 30s because he had done it all. Former NSA, the man is a literal genius, who then sets my video projector on his kitchen table, he asks his assistant, this long-haired guy with a beard that you couldn't trust to tell you the truth, and he goes out and says, get this particular kit, he comes in, starts disassembling as we talk, and I said, shouldn't we get on the internet and get a schematic? They said, ah, no, we don't need that. And he kept on talking, tears this thing apart. And now, I would like to take a break. <laughs> because each week on Shabbat Night Live, we give you, out there in cyberspace, those of you who are watching on broadcast television and watching this on YouTube, live stream, Roku, uh, iTunes, uh, in future generations even. The reason why this is out there and goes on is because we have put it all out there, free of charge to the whole world, and to keep on going, we need you to support this ministry. After I am gone, this word will keep on going out there, but you have to be a part of it. You have to take on your responsibility. We have freely given, now you must freely give. And so we give you this opportunity to be a part of and support this ministry so truth can go out over the airwaves in the small window of time that we have to reach the world. We'll be back just after this. As we are sitting at the kitchen table and John Fiala, the 
retired former senior avionics engineer of Continental Airlines, the airlines that broke my video projector, is tearing it apart. We begin discussing the Ark of the Covenant and the details of what I was in uh, the city of Houston sharing for the Prophecy Club. And as he was uh, taking it all apart, then he sees what's wrong, pulls out the parts on this, and then he calls up Polaroid. Polaroid doesn't have any parts, they're all in Singapore. And I need it to get on the plane. It's impossible to get this thing done. So he says, no worry, follow me. He takes me out from his living area, out into the airport hangar area, where I am looking at several layers going up three stories of industrial racking. I look up there and I see underwater scuba gear with the tanks and the underwater, uh, underwater scuba gear up there. I'm seeing equipment up there and he said, and so I begin commenting about this, and he said, uh, you'll enjoy one of my toys, and so he steps over and, and pulls out an M16, a shortened M16 full automatic with a flash, excuse me, with the silencer on it, laser sighting, and, and he says, don't worry, I'm licensed for this. I've never seen this. This is like, you know, James Bond movies. You know, this is what like M brings out and says this is the latest thing. And then he said, uh, uh, this is a military laser on this. It is shine a mile away. It's uh, illegal for civilians to even have this thing. It's not even on the market outside. No one can have this. Would you like one? And so from then on, every presentation I did, I've got a military grade laser pointing at things on the screen, hoping I wasn't gonna melt the screen in front of me. But he then gets on a lift, goes over to the third rack and pulls down this pallet and drives along, I walk along behind him, and he goes over to his 220 volt system, sets this thing down and plugs it in and there, while he's talking with me, he manufactures the part out of a space age alloy. We go back in and he said, I'll have this together by six o'clock tonight. Can I invite my friends over tonight and you do a presentation for me and my friends tonight? I said, if you get this thing working, I'll stay up all night and do a presentation for you. Six o'clock comes, it's been together, 15 minutes ago. Plug it in, it works flawlessly. And now, his living room, dining room are filled with people. I do the presentation, The Great Secret of Solomon's Temple, and how the Ark of the Covenant was hidden by using the mechanics that I was able to figure out from Egyptian technology and then bring it into what we saw on the ground there in the land of Israel. These are things that Eduardo Reconati, Temple Church Institute, never even thought of. But this is what I put together. And as I get to that place, the whole room is just a buzz. And then in the back row, John stands up when I show this whole thing. He stands up, he's bouncing his chair, he finally stands up. He says, that's not it. That's not it. That's just about it, but that's not quite it. He said, Sand hydraulic elevator systems in ancient temples has been my hobby for my entire life. I want you to come back at the end of this Prophecy Club tour and I want you to spend two weeks with me because we are going to build the, ar the elevator system for the hiding of the Ark of the Covenant knowing everything we know about sand hydraulics in ancient temples and that's what we're gonna do. Oh, okay, shut my mouth. <laughs> now I know it wasn't that that projector would be immediately healed by the Almighty for me to continue doing what I always did. He put me on the one place on planet Earth with the one man who had been up under the dome of the spirits numerous times who worked NSA, National Security Agency, with the United States government, black operations. This guy is absolutely, he is a genius. I don't say that lightly. Now I get to stay, stay with him 
for two weeks in his airplane hangar, but the tour must go on. I go on from there and I go to Florida. I get a call from Stan Johnson. He says, we've been praying about this this morning and I'm calling you up and I'm gonna ask you to not teach what you're teaching. That he, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant with many for one week. And I said, Stan, let me pray about it. I wrote Stan back. I gave him the detail from the book of Kings. A prophet was told to go to where an altar was built in Israel and to prophesy against that altar in the face of the king. He was told, do not eat anything, do not drink anything, do not stay there, you go right straight back from where I sent you after you do this. So the young prophet went up, he spoke against the altar, said the ashes were going to be poured out, the king reached out his head, said grab that man, and the king's hand shriveled up just like that. And then the prophet spoke a word to him. The altar dumped over, all the ashes were poured out exactly what he said. And then the king asked for his hand to be restored, the prophet prayed and his hand was restored. The man is on the way back just as he was told. And then an old prophet sent his servants to him and said, here, the old prophet is a man of God like you are. And the Lord told me to tell you to come and to eat and drink with me. And the young prophet said, no, the Lord didn't tell me to do that. I said, the Lord told me to tell you to do that. And so the young prophet went in, he ate and drank with them. While he's sitting there, the old prophet said, you have disobeyed Yahovah. Your life is gonna be taken from you. The man saddles his ass, he's on his way. A few hours later, the servants of the old prophet come back with a report. You know the young prophet that you ate with and drank with here? He's up the road, there's a lying lion that is standing by his ass, and the lion has killed the prophet. The lion isn't hungry. It killed the man standing there by the ass. As an example, it's like that lion was sent to do one thing, to kill that prophet. After I gave that example, I wrote it all out, and then Stan, I said, Stan, I will obey your wishes as far as my ass and my carcass will allow. <laughs> that night I went in and I taught, and he shall confirm the covenant with more fire and more fever than I ever had before, knowing that he could push the button and I would be gone that this opportunity to reach the whole world could end just like that. Because I knew that he was given that word to call me up and tell me not to do it because this was a test of the Almighty. Am I going to do it because I can make $200 a night and get my message out to the world? Or am I gonna compromise? Or am I going to do what I was sent to do? I did what I was sent to do. Now, the last night of that tour, 13 cities. And to 13 cities, you have had 13 nights in order to hone this message down and get it right down. Now, Lester Summerall's television studio, the C Network. Now the cameras are rolling, it is live to tape. Everything is set to go, and that night I preach it, but I don't have four hours that I've been taking, four and a half hours that I was taking every night. I would keep people up until the wee hours and answering questions till one in the morning, night after night, because everything I do, every place I go, I treat it like this is the last moment I have with this people ever, and I'm gonna give them every ounce that I've got. And so 13 nights I've done this, and now the final night, and I preach, and he, the Messiah, will confirm the covenant 
when I got in the car with Ron, excuse me, with Stan and Leslie on the way back to the hotel that night. He said, I really appreciate it, brother, how you did what you did, you said what you felt you had to say, and you didn't embarrass me. And we became very good friends that night. And I said, Stan, you know, I, I knew that, uh, you know, the, the speakers on the Protestant Club, I knew that there was things, things going on. I said, Stan, I want to do the next 13 cities. They had 45 cities all together. I want to do 13 more cities. And he said, you can't. It's impossible. He said, we had one person who said they could do it. They went through the, they went through the next 13. They got through five cities. They collapsed, and they quit right there, and I was left hanging. I said, Stan, this is a picnic for me. I live to do this. I can do it. And so, okay, you say you can do it. And so I did the next 13 cities. And then I did the next 13 cities, 45 cities without taking a break. Right at the end of it, I said, Stan, I want to do those 45 cities and now speak the fall feast of the Lord because I just did the spring feast. He said, I thought you did the spring and the fall feast. No, I can only get the spring feast done. And so I went and did 45 more cities, 90 cities in a row. And at the end of the 90th city, my staff had two more engagements immediately booked for me. I was spent, went to Kansas City and my throat, I was spitting up blood. That's why my throat today is very hoarse. I have no depth, no resonance left because I lost my voice. I couldn't speak for a month and literally I was spitting up blood. My vocal cords were raw and, and that was it. I, w- I, I went up to uh, northern Minnesota. I went up to two harbors and they said, don't talk to anyone and I just went into seclusion and let my voice heal. I can't sing anymore, but you know what? I sang my song in life. It doesn't matter that I can't hit any high notes, I can't hit any low notes, it doesn't matter that my voice is all hoarse and raspy now, because I got to deliver the message that I was sent on concerning the Ark of the Covenant, the spring and the fall feast of the Lord being prophetic shadow pictures of good things to come. That is the framework whereby the Almighty is told the end of time from the very beginning, and that is the key to unlocking the chronology of the Gospels, Yeshua fulfilling the spring feast of the Lord of the day, hour, and exact moment, and every detail in which they were rehearsed in the temple for a thousand years, and the book of the Revelation is the Messiah fulfilling the fall feast in every detail, with the same accuracy as he fulfilled the spring feast when he comes back to establish himself as the king of kings and rule from his throne in Jerusalem forever. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the chronological gospels. And now, even if I can't speak as strongly or as longly, yet that message can still go out to this day. I went back to Israel. I got back to Israel, I was in the city, and I went up to Mount Gerizim, Har Bracha, the Mount of Blessing. On the side of the Mount of Blessing, Har Bracha, there's an old Arab house that no longer has any doors, any windows there, and this is where Shomer Levan and his family lived. You see, Shomer, the American chiropractor known as Mark White, who came to Israel with his whole family and a group of people and said we wanted to learn the ancient paths, They got there, and you can't learn the ancient paths on a three-month visa, tourist visa. So what did they do? They burned their passports. They're in Israel to stay. Well, you think they're in Israel to stay. They go out and stay in the sheep sheep caves of Tekoa. They're out there for like a year. And then, finally, they get arrested. They're gonna be sent out of the country. As the head of the family, now Shemer is brought in before the Ministry of the Interior. They've got all their head people. This is a big case because they've seen him on, uh, you know, this picture appears in the paper. This thing has been spread all about because this guy is amazing. You know, everybody loves him, but yet he's completely illegal. After spending nine months living with the Bedouins, he says, we're out of here. The Bedouins are using generators to charge their cell phones and watch, watch Jerry Springer on their televisions and their tents. He says, we're out of here. 
And so they go out and live in the sheep caves of Tekoa. No running water, no electricity. They're down in this wadi, living the life off the grid. They got it made, but they get arrested. Finally, the day comes, they put the papers before him, he is being ejected, deported from the land of Israel. They put the papers before him that he's supposed to sign and it says that he'll not be able to come back to Israel for a year. And he sits there at this big conference table with all these head muckety mucks have all been assembled because they have got to take a stand against this person. He's here illegally. It doesn't matter that the mayor of Jerusalem loves him and loves his family, that he is an asset to the state of Israel. It doesn't matter. They all have determined this what they have to do. And so now they give him the pen and he sees that he's not allowed to return to Israel for a year. He puts the pen down and says, I can't sign this. What do you mean you can't sign this? It says that, I will not be allowed to come back to Israel for a year. The Torah tells me that I'm to come to Jerusalem three times a year for the feast. I cannot sign anything that would hold me in violation of God's word. And he said the room went absolutely cold. No one had anything they couldn't say. They were speechless. Finally, a minute passed. The woman at the end of the table said, Well, I think if you go down and live down by Jericho with the Arabs, you won't have any trouble. He walked out, they moved down to Jericho and lived there for well over a year and then they decided to travel by camel to the side of Harbacha, the Mount of Blessing, up on top of which is the Samaritan village. And there is where I would visit them often. Now I have to cut the story even shorter here. Shomer, I would go up there every time I came into town, I'd go down to the Mahani Yehuda Shuk and I'd get a 50 pound bag of oatmeal and I'd put it in uh, a taxi. I would then go over to East Jerusalem and, and pay two and a half shekels for a cheroot, a shared taxi to take us over to uh, Ramallah. And over at Ramallah, then I'd take an Arab cab and it would take me to uh, Shechem or Nablus. Now, we don't do that anymore. There have been a lot of people killed doing that very same thing. We don't do that anymore. But I would always take that 50 pound bag of oatmeal, I'd get so far, I'd put it on my shoulders, I'd hike up over the hill up on the side of the, of the Harbacha, and then I'd stay with them for a couple days. They would then cook on their sod, you know, they'd build a fire and then put their upside down walk and they cook their food in there. And I'd stay with them up there. And then I'd turn around and go back to Jerusalem after visiting a few days and getting an update on, you know, living the ancient past. Uh, his wife, his wife, uh, uh, Shomer's wife, uh, she was the one who first made me my first jalabia, hand sewn jalabia. Reuben Prager didn't make my first one. This is what they wore. They wanted me to have one when I stayed with them. I always wore my white uh, linen jalabia. When I got back to Jerusalem, I didn't wear it because I didn't want anyone to think that I was completely off my rocker. I was gonna save that for television later. (laughs) And so when it came time for a rude awakening from Israel, you know, it was a natural. I'm going to wear ancient biblical garments. She's gonna sew these garments. Reuben Prager's gonna make my tallit and I'm going to dress in the everyday garb of a normal Israelite at that period of time. And that's why I'm not wearing a three-piece suit with a pocket watch out in the ashen remains of the city of Gomorrah with a Hollywood televangelistic hairdo. So I go back to Jerusalem and Shomer comes into town a month later. He he then gets a hold of me and, and asks to meet with me. He said, now I can't tell you anything, but except this. I had a dream two nights ago, and in this dream I was instructed, and he said, now this was a vision dream. This was not from eating bad oatmeal. He said, I was instructed to take Yohanan, which is like 80 years old, 
the two of us were to take no money and we were to walk up to Jerusalem and go to the cave right behind the bus station and we were going to go down into that cave and we were to pray there. And he said, I don't know what's going to happen, but I want you to know ahead of time that we're going down there. Now I know that an Arab owns that cave. It's used to store fresh fruits and vegetables down there. It's in the East Jerusalem, in this Arab area, and he was instructed to go there and to go down in there and pray. And he's not gonna tell me anymore. There's nothing more to know. But he wants me to know, if anything happens, this is what I am instructed to do. So, the day following, I start to get more of the details of what transpired. Shomer and Yohanan go over there, they go down to that huge cave down there, which is called Jeremiah's Grotto, which is adjacent to the garden tomb and the Ark of the Covenant dig. It's immediately adjacent to that. He goes down there and the place is locked up. They stand there and they pray. They don't know what to do, but they know they're supposed to go inside and pray. So they turn around, go up this little area, this little road, and then go into a barber shop on the left-hand side, and this is all Arab there. He goes in there and speaks to the owner of the place and said, we were instructed by the Lord to come up and pray in this, in this cave down here. Do you know how we can get in? The man said, come back in one hour. They left, they come back in an hour, and then when he walks in, the man then shuts the door behind him, takes a key off the wall, one key, opens the door, walks down and unlocks it. This man has a key to that cave. He called the owner of the cave and said, two men are here because he said that their God told them that they needed to come down to this cave and pray. He said, let them in. He unlocks it, they go in there and pray. In the meantime, the owner of the cave comes down and he asks them, why are you here? Why are you praying here? And they told him the story. And he, Shomer tells him the, the story. And then he, he said, something is very important about this cave and I need to know what it is. He said, several years ago, the Israelis came to me and said that they wanted to buy this cave. And much of the produce in this area, you know, I'm responsible for it. It's all stored here. This is a very important place. I said, I don't want to sell it. Our family has been under the control of our family for hundreds of years. I, I'm not going to sell it. And after much talking with them, then they took out a checkbook and they turned it around and said, you fill in the number. When they said that, I became frightened. I don't know why they wanted it. I don't know why there is no number that's too big for this cave. And I said, come back later. They came back and he had made inquiry and he was told, this is the word that I got, that he was told by Yasser Arafat that under no conditions is he to sell that cave. And just a few weeks later, they began the construction of a minaret right outside the door to make it a holy site for Islam. He said, now, after this happened, and I refused to sell it, then what the Israelis did is they came in and they shut the bus station down. This is the bus station of the Arabs that service the whole area. If you wanna go any place, you wanna go to Jericho, you wanna go anywhere, and you're Arab, that's your bus station. They shut it down for remodeling. And then what they did is they pitched a huge tent out in the back area there and they had trucks coming in and people coming in and out of that, and you couldn't get in that tent. They had a guard on it day and night. 
and this is up on the upper level, right below the place of the skull, this is what they put there. And they said that there was some kind of gas leak that don't worry, they're taking care of it, it's not gonna cost anybody anything. But this is where they're gonna fix this gas leak. Two months later, everything is gone. What is going on? This Shomer is telling me all this that transpired. And after this, Americans got together trying to help this man get asylum in America because he knew that his family's life was in danger if he released any part of this to go out of this. I know the people that were trying to raise the money and trying to get him the route out of there. Why did they want this? Because if they could get that cave, they could bring in full-size dump trucks, and jackhammers, industrial equipment, and they could burrow down to get to where the Ark of the Covenant was because they couldn't get the Ark out the way that Wyatt found it. And this was their opportunity. And when that didn't work, then they tried going in another way, but they couldn't get all the equipment in to be able to do it at that point. And so after a couple months, they bailed on it, and then they refurbished the Arab bus station, and it's back in operation today. We're gonna be back for more detail on Shomer and what happened with the Department of Antiquities in our next session. I'd like to pray. Yehovah, I'll bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you his peace in the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Have a good week. Shabbat Tov, and we'll see you back here next week for the rest of the story on Shabbat Night Live. Sayonara, adios, hasta la vista.